Turn with me to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, and we're going to be continuing on in our series through the Gospel of Matthew. And before we get started, I don't know about you, but, but I could use some prayer. So uh, let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are a faithful God, that you have literally moved history in such a way as to bring about redemption. But more than that, that you have extended your kingdom and you are extending your kingdom throughout the whole world. Lord, I ask that you would send the Spirit to convict us of our sin this morning and that you would cause the Scriptures to be illumined. Not so that we could know more information, but so that we could grow in a deeper relationship with you. Lord, help bury this treasure in our heart that we might go forth and do the work of the kingdom. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, if I was to ask you, or ask anyone for that matter, what is the gospel, we would get probably a myriad of different explanations. And most of them would be rooted in truth. Some people would say something to the effect of it has to do with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and that's true. Some might say that it's the atoning work of Christ on the cross, that is that Jesus Christ bore the sin, bore our sin rather, and uh, absorbed the wrath of God on our behalf, and that we are saved by grace through Jesus' merit, and that we can apprehend these truths by faith. In other words, faith is the instrument that God uses to apply salvation to his people. The reformers called this the five solas, that we are saved by faith alone, by grace alone, because of the work of Christ alone, and for the glory of God alone. And as true as all of these things are, as accurate as all of these things are, and as good as all of these things are, that's not the complete picture of the gospel. In fact, in the last, I don't know, 40 or 50 years or so, at least, we have traded in the robust, full gospel message for one that's just, hey, this is Jesus and me. This is Jesus in me. So as long as I have a great relationship with Jesus in my prayer closet, then that's all that matters. But friends, that is not the gospel message. It is a truncated version of the gospel that rightfully asserts the salvation of the individual sinner, but it oftentimes does so at the expense of what God has promised to do and is doing in the world. Remember last week I said that the the, the biblical storyline and one that Matthew is trying to paint for us, which is why we're going back to the Old Testament every chance we can get, is that, 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 that the biblical author, the Holy Spirit, through his servants, are telling a heart gripping, multi volume epic that ultimately tells the story of God's undeniable faithfulness to his people. But this morning, what I want us to do is I want us to look at this. Peace here in the beginning of uh, Matthew chapter 3 that we touched on this gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. And the reason for that is because God's faithfulness to his people is not just applied to you and me and to three of our best friends, but, but the entire world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That you ever had faith in him, right? should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus came to save the world. And that is a beautiful piece of the gospel that oftentimes we would neglect. See, a lot of times the gospel message is less about getting you to heaven. Or or wait, let me rephrase that. The gospel oftentimes is preached that way, but the gospel message is less about getting you to heaven when you die and more about getting heaven here. This prayer that Jesus has with his disciples, you may remember this story, he prays what? That the kingdom would come. The kingdom would come. And God has promised in his scriptures to make that a reality. Now, what I'm not trying to do is say that the individual piece of Christianity is problematic. I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is that's a piece of the gospel of the kingdom. 
The gospel of the kingdom is important to wrap our minds around because it's the first thing that John says in Matthew chapter 3, right? When he started his ministry, he came saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As a matter of fact, let's go ahead and just read it. Matthew chapter 3. Let's read the first 12 verses again. Now, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or it's near or here. Which, by the way, this is the same message that Jesus preaches in just a chapter later. That's the first words out of his mouth. For this is one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem was going out to him and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to or for Abraham. The axe is already laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winning fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is the word of the Lord. This is the word of the living God. And here's another thing that you have to understand. Yes, the gospel is about a savior, but it is also about a king and a kingdom. And that's why he says here, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven coming is a message, and here's what I want you guys to understand that the people of the time frame would have understood. This is not something hidden, something surprising, that actually the Jewish people were expecting a Messiah. They were expecting a kingdom to come, and they understood that that was really good news. So what do we have in this passage? I won't rehearse the entire thing, but just for those of you who are visiting us, I want to catch you up to speed. Matthew was written to tell us a story, and that story is about a king. A king that has come into history. Prophecy after prophecy after prophecy has shown him to be this king. And it's been quite mind-blowing if you have been paying attention. But there here in this chapter is a sermon that is preaching judgment. There is a coming disaster, a coming judgment of God that he is trying to get people to understand is coming. And he's actually quite surprised when some of these Pharisees and Sadducees, the pastors of the day, come up, right? He says that uh, in chapter 3 here. He says, who warned you, you brood of vipers, verse 7, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? There is wrath right around the corner. God is going to judge the covenant breakers. And he's going to do so in the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. And he's forecasting this reality, and he's offering people a way out. He's saying, repent, turn from your sin, trust in this Jesus, trust in this king, and life can be yours. But, and this is not a popular message, if you choose not to repent, if you choose to walk in your rebellion, you will suffer hellfire. So what do they do? What do they do? Well, that's for a different time to discuss how they respond as we move through the Gospel of Matthew. But one of the things that I want you to understand, one of the things that John wants you to understand, is that Jesus can wrap you in his arms. He can save you, or he can put you under his feet. And that's important, 
Because we're going to be talking about Psalm 110, which is God's favorite Bible verse, because he uses it so much throughout the New Testament that it's clear. Victory belongs to Jesus, and everybody who stands in the way will be put under his feet. Will be put under his feet. And so John the Baptist here is the forerunner for Jesus to pave the way for his public ministry, which we are going to get into next week. And and all of this building, all of this anticipation. And I hope you can feel that. I hope you can feel that sitting in the seat like, okay, all right, uh, we've talked about some of this stuff already. Um, When's Jesus going to get here? When he's going to get on the scene? Because that's the anticipation that the Jewish people would have had. And that's the one that the, the text is trying to get you to rest in. Once again. This idea of the gospel of the kingdom would not have been foreign to the original hearers. The idea of the Messiah King was come, that, that, that a Messiah king was coming to set up a kingdom and rule over that kingdom and put all other kingdoms to shame, to set right what, went, uh, to set right what once went wrong, to bring justice, reconciliation, and peace. That's this God. He's come to make a way. He's come to make a way of reconciliation and of peace for the nations. And what does that mean? That means that we are estranged from God. But more on that in a moment. This message here, this preaching of the gospel of the kingdom is not just some horse that we're trying to ride here at Harmony, but actually it's the reason that Jesus came. So, so why is it important that we spend an entire sermon talking about the gospel of the kingdom? Well, I'll tell you why. Luke 4.43, Jesus says this to the crowds of people uh, standing around him as he's teaching. He said, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So Jesus certainly has said in other places that he has other purposes. For instance, there's a famous one for he came to seek and to save the lost. And that's true. None of the things that Jesus said he came for are mutually exclusive. That is, they can all work together and they do work together harmoniously. They fit in this multi-volume epic underneath that same umbrella, accomplishing the same task. God can, through Jesus Christ, save individuals and save the world. He can both seek and save the lost and make it his priority to preach the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God, and hear this, because it's not said a ton. It might be said here because Darren's your pastor as well. Uh, But here's the deal. The kingdom makes it possible for you to be saved. If it wasn't for the gospel of the kingdom, you wouldn't be able to grab hold of Jesus. It is the mission of God. So you might be asking, okay, what is this kingdom of God? Well, a guy by the name of Gary North in one of his books says very simply that the kingdom of God is the civilization of God. Now, that's one way to look at it. Another guy by the name of R.J. Rush Dooney says that the, reign, uh, that the kingdom of God is the reign of God in every realm. The total sovereignty of God and his word for every sphere of life. But let me, let me say it this way. The kingdom of God, most simply put, is just the rule of God on earth. The rule of God on earth. It's not a spiritual kingdom that exists in the ethereal or in the spiritual places, though it's not less than that. It is a spiritual kingdom in that it's a kingdom of believers, but it is here. It's present, it's physical, and it's doing things in the world. But it's, it's not a kingdom either that some, uh, some denominations and theologies would teach that it's way off in the future after the second coming of Christ. Then a kingdom will be set up. No, no, Jesus says what? Or John the Baptist rather says, but Jesus will echo the same thing uh, in Matthew chapter 4. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Some translations say that the kingdom of God is near, and other translations even say the kingdom of God is here. So Jesus starts, John starts, preaching on this kingdom of God. So it, the kingdom of God, in other words, is the creation, the entire area under the king of heaven's lawful dominion. It is the area that fell under Satan's reign in history as a result of Adam's rebellion when man fell 
He brought the whole world under God's curse. The curse extended as far as the reign of sin did. This meant everything under man's dominion. This is what it still means, that the laws of the kingdom of God extend just as far as sin does. It has a jurisdiction. This means, in simple terms, every area of your life should be governed by the ethical demands that the kingdom of God makes. And the kingdom of God is going to spread so that it will flood everywhere that that curse is found. And you already know this. Because you sing it every Christmas. Far as the curse is found. That's how much this whole thing works. As far as the curse is found. And just so you know, it's everywhere. <laughs> it's everywhere. God owns the world. God owns the universe. God owns you if you love him and you have submitted to him. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and all that it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. So if that's true, and it's always been true, and it has always been true, that God has been sovereign since the day he created us. He's been, so to speak, a king since the fall and before. So what's new about this new kingdom of God within the new covenant? Well, for one... The head brings redemption, and it's Jesus. It's Jesus. And so, if you would, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. This should be a familiar passage to you. Passage to you. And, I, and, I, and, and I'm doing this on purpose. All right? When Jesus was prophesied to come, in other Gospels, and even in the Gospel we were just in, they like to quote this passage, and we say it oftentimes in our Christmas service, but I want you to pay special close attention to what's being said. Look for things that maybe you haven't looked for in the past. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 says this, For a child will be born to us, that is Jesus, a prophecy, a son will be given to us in the government. Do you ever really think about that word when you read this passage? And the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called what? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father and Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Here's the deal, guys. Jesus Christ is not running for king. He's not campaigning. He's not vying for votes. Jesus Christ came to be the king. He came to be the king and to rule over his people. And it's a good king. He's a good ruler. He says here that he has come to establish and uphold justice and righteousness. And here's another piece that I want you uh, to grab a hold of that we're going to get into a little bit more. Is that this government that will be resting on his shoulder, this peace that he's bringing, it says here, will increase. And it won't end. That from the time, the moment that Jesus stepped foot on this earth, when he was born, when he came in the flesh as the incarnation of the Son of God, that he came to set up a kingdom that would steadily increase for the rest of future history until all enemies have been put under his feet. Another prophecy was made along these same lines. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. 
says this. I kept looking in the night visions. This is Daniel. And he's seeing this vision. He's interpreting this dream for King Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, all right. Uh, <laughs> he's interpreting this dream and he sees it and he says, I, I was looking in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming. Which, by the way, if you read your Gospels often, you will know that the Son of Man is a, 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 a title that Jesus chooses for himself. And as a, as a matter of fact, it is the most used title that he uses for himself. It's his absolute favorite. And the reason it's his favorite is because it points to the Old Testament and it points to what's happening. Okay? Jesus doesn't waste words. Everything that he says has a purpose, and everything that he says has deep, rich, theological, and historical meaning. And so when Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, what he's doing is trying to get you to think of this. And he came up to the Ancient of Days, and it was presented before him, and to him, that is Jesus, was given dominion glory and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is what? An everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. See, within Israel's history, there was a lot of tumultuous seas, if you will. Lots of kingdoms falling, lots of kingdoms rising, lots of kingdoms crushing Israel, lots of Israel crushing other kingdoms. There was this flux that was going on throughout the course of history where it wasn't sure who was reigning. And guess what? Israel, at the same exact time, was falling into sin and doing the things that they were doing. And as a matter of fact, is what's being addressed in Matthew chapter 3. So this, this was comforting. That this Messiah, this king, would come and set up a kingdom that would never pass away. Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 2 paints this picture of a kingdom that is perfect, where people won't learn war anymore. As a matter of fact, it says they'll turn their, 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 their ammo, their guns, into garden utensils. Now, for those of you who like to shoot, that may not be the most prettiest passage, but what it's doing is it's, it's talking about peace, right? It's talking about this reality that there won't be war. There won't be anger with one another. We will go to the house of the Lord. We'll stream up. And here's, here's the cool thing about that. Uh, does water stream up? No. It streams down. It streams down. And this is important because God is doing something. God is causing that which shouldn't exist to exist, namely a kingdom people who are evil. He's changing and transforming their hearts, as Ezekiel 36 says, taking it from heart of stone to a heart of flesh. And this idea that Jesus is the king is why the temptation narrative, which will happen next week, or the week after, depending on how things go next week, they knew Satan knew that this is what Jesus came to do, to set up this kingdom, which is why he said, I'll give you, look at that, if you, if you, if you listen to me, right, I'll give you all that. If you serve me, I'll give you all that. All the kingdom. You see that? See that? It's yours. Serve me. Jesus said, I'm good. Why? He had a better promise from God that he would be the king over an everlasting kingdom, one that would not pass away. And that's beautiful. And that's beautiful. And then, before we move on, I want to just talk about 1 Corinthians 15. So you guys are wondering, okay, that's cool and all. How does this all play itself out? Well, a little bit of a cheat sheet here. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us exactly how future history is going to unfold. That's right. We're going to tell you the future today. Now, what I don't mean by that is that I know the future. I, the only way I know the future is because God says it. I don't have any special revelation. No spirits are whispering in my ears. I have the Word of God. And the Word of God tells me this, starting in verse 22 of chapter 15, how 
this kingdom situation is going to unfold. As a matter of fact, if you have time after church, go back and read all of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 because that's the gospel. It starts out with sin, Adam's rebellion, our participation in it, and then it traces it. And this just shows you how the biblical authors thought about what Jesus was actually doing. And guess what? It's bigger than just the individual salvation of our hearts, though it's not less than that. So we go from this sin piece, and then it talks about the resurrection, and we get it here in verse 22. Just follow along with me. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, after that those who are at Christ coming. Then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has, been ab- when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign. If you're an underliner, that's the spot. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. That is a quotation from Psalm 110. And the last enemy that will be abolished is death. Now, if this timeline confuses you, let me break it down for you. Jesus has saved a people for himself. He's extending his mercy through his kingdom to the entire world. There will come a time when we will die. And we will either die in Adam, that is in our sin and in our rebellion, or we will die in Christ. And then he talks about, and this is, by the way, this is in the context of an argue, argument about whether or not we are resurrected. And, he, and Paul's making the argument that if we don't get resurrected, then Jesus doesn't get resurrected. And then that's a, that's a very big problematic thing because he resurrected. He's ruling and reigning as king right now. And then he says, when does the end come? After all enemies have been put under his feet. After all rule and authority and power had been abolished. And then what? And then what does he do? He gives that kingdom back to the Father. He gives that kingdom back to the Father. If you didn't know this, salvation of your individual soul and salvation of the entire world is not really about you. And that might scare you a little bit if you've never heard it quite like that. But here's the reality. The Trinitarian effort to save humanity some people have called it a relational dance if you will but the bible makes it very clear that the reason that people are saved that kingdoms are saved that the world is saved is so that god could be glorified and that's good news for you it's good news for you that you're not that awesome that you're not that worthy Because if you're not that worthy and you're not that awesome, then God doesn't have to work hard to please you. You get to actually just rest in his awesomeness. You get to rest in his beauty. You get to rest in his salvation in a wonderful and beautiful way. But here's the deal. God elects a people. Jesus goes to die on the cross, lived the perfect life, died the death that we deserve to die, He procures a people for himself, and then the Holy Spirit applies that salvific work to the individual by their faith. And they do this, and some theologians call it a love gift, that Jesus, after he procures these people, after the kingdoms of the world become the kingdoms of the Christ, he then gives that kingdom back to the Father. And then he conquers that last enemy, which is death. Do you see Christ as cosmically as the Bible does? Do you? Christ is cosmic. He's history altering. As a matter of fact, the Bible makes it plain when it says that all things were created for and through Jesus Christ. He's it. He's at the top. Everything else flows out of that reality that Jesus is preeminent over everything. Now, the question then becomes, 
How does that happen? How does he put all enemies under his feet? The first one we've talked about before, but we're going to talk about again, especially since there's new people here. Preachers can never get away from preaching the gospel. God grows his kingdom. He puts all enemies under his feet by conquering, firstly, the hearts of rebellious men. Now, this is important because as soon as I start talking about God's kingdom overwhelming the world, producing fruit, that he wins the nations, that he's putting all enemies under his feet, all of a sudden people can say, oh, or lob the accusation, or you might be thinking, okay, so what do we got to do? What laws do we have to pass? Right? What political regime do we get involved in? And those are good conversations to have and one we, ones we should have, right? But first and foremost, outside of that reality, we start with the heart of human beings. Sinful, rebellious human beings. We can't... I was about to say something that I used to say all the time, but my theology has changed, so I have to backtrack a little bit there. Here's the deal. John Calvin says, It is certain that all men are untamed till Christ subdues them by the gospel. Can we do good in the world? Yes. Should we do good in the world? Yes. Can we do that without the Holy Spirit transforming our hearts? No. No. Now, does that mean that non-Christians can't have good marriages? No. Does that mean that a non-Christian can't go and feed the homeless? No. What it means is no one is motivated with the correct motivations apart from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit transforms and changes our heart, and that is what is needed in order for us first to see the kingdom of God, John 3 makes this clear. We have to be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. Ezekiel 36, 26 talks about the new covenant. What's different about the new covenant, which is what we exist under, praise God, is that our hearts are changed. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I, that is God, will give you, that is rebellious sinners, a new heart. And put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now, if that language is confusing to you, it means this, that your heart, as Jeremiah says, is wicked above all things. It's hard to understand it. Our hearts from birth are completely twisted, pointed at evil. We need a miracle to change. Our hearts are murderous. Our thoughts are twisted. We'll do anything and everything to escape not being the God of our own lives. And here's the deal. We have to have, we have to come to ourselves, as Scripture says. We have to come to the reality that there is nothing innate in us that is any good. That we need a good shepherd to hold on to in order to be saved. As a matter of fact, our sin is so vile against God that He has to punish it. He has to destroy it. But there is a way out. Isaiah Another prophecy of Jesus. Isaiah 53, this is another one that you might be familiar with. And it tells us how the kingdom of God is procured, so to speak. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5 says this, But he, that is Jesus, was pierced through for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and his scourgings were he uh, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep, we need that shepherd, like I said, have turned away, 
have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. This is one of the most important pieces of the gospel. There's so much bad teaching out there in the world that would tell you that you know why God loves you? Because you're awesome. You know why God loves you? Because you're worth it. Because you were created in the image of God and there's no way that he could hate you. Now you were made in the image of God, but here's the deal. The wages of sin are death and in order for us to be cared for, us to have salvation, the Son of God, according to this text, had to be slaughtered. He had to absorb the wrath of God on our behalf. When you are saved, you are not first saved by, or saved from sin, rather. You are saved from the wrath of God. And once you are saved, and you are brought into fellowship with the God of the universe, you are adopted into his family, then, then, we can start understanding more about what the kingdom is about. But it starts there. You don't get a kingdom without transformed hearts. So God grows his kingdom, firstly, by conquering the hearts of rebellious men. Secondly, God grows his kingdom surely and progressively. Surely and progressively. One of the prophecies that speaks of the kingdom growing is Habakkuk 2.14, which says the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. How much water covers the seas, friends? All of it. Every single bit of the earth will be covered with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Everything and everyone is getting wet. That's assuredly true. But it doesn't happen overnight. It happens progressively. We can think about the parables that are told in the Gospels of the mustard seed and the leaven and the bread. That the kingdom of God starts out small. The smallest seeds. And then it grows and it grows and grows until it's bigger than all of the other trees in the garden. So if you're looking out at the world and you're saying, man, I have no idea what's going on here. It looks like the world's just getting worse, and you're trying to tell me that the kingdom is growing, and that that's part of the gospel message, is that there's a king coming to change everything, to bring reconciliation, to bring peace. How is that happening? It happens small. In small ways that we might overlook. But it does happen. It does happen, and this is proven to us in things like Psalm 2. If you want to go ahead and turn there with me. I know we're getting a lot of scripture, but that's a good problem. Psalm 2 says this in verse 8. Ask of me, God says, of his anointed one, and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. And one of the things a theologian by the name of Greg Bonson used to say is, do you think that Jesus forgot to ask? No. No. Jesus is getting the nations, the ends of the earth as his possession. So we have a progressive and sure reality that this kingdom is going to progressively grow. And the third thing. So firstly, we have God grows his kingdom, firstly, by conquering the hearts of rebellious men. Secondly, that God grows his kingdom, surely, but progressively. And thirdly, God grows his kingdom through his people. So how is God putting all enemies under Jesus' feet? Well, One of those ways is you and me and us. In other words, if you've been saved by the work of Jesus and you have submitted to him as Lord and Christ, you have been transformed from the kingdom of darkness, or transferred rather, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. And that means that you actually have to do something. You are now a citizen of that kingdom. This is why, do you know what I mean when I say this Jesus and me theology? This idea where you kind of just... Jesus is just between you and him. 
The world doesn't need to know about it. Your job doesn't need to know about it. Your kids don't really need to know. You're just going to go and you're going to pray and you're going to do your thing. Why that's so... Why that makes the church so impotent, why it makes the kingdom so impotent, is because you're, 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 you're hiding Jesus you're from the world. Do you remember this? Uh, there's this passage, uh, this, this parable that's being told um, about this lamp basket. It's in Matthew chapter 5. Um, it's a little bit further on. We'll talk about it. And he talks about how we're not, we're not to be like a lamp that has something put on top of it. And that's an important thing to consider, but, but there's, some, <laughs> there's some really bad theology out there. When I was a kid, we used to sing this song in church, This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I'm not going to sing it for you, but you know what I'm saying. Okay? That, that's really cool, except for it's incomplete, and it kind of teaches bad theology in a way. Okay? And what I mean by that is what we're not doing is, and what Jesus is not saying in that parable, is that what you need to do is show off whatever it is Jesus has done for you. Now, there's a time and a place to tell your testimony. As a matter of fact, before you get a baptism, sometimes that happens. In the course of conversation with friends, it's it's good to say, hey, man, that's what Jesus has done for me. But our primary primary purpose is is actually this. I want you to think about the picture like this, with the basket and the light. What What Jesus is saying, and what I'm trying to communicate to you, is that to live, letting your light shine, so to speak, is less about the lamp putting off light, and putting off beauty. It's not, it's not the lamp in a room that puts out beauty. It reveals the beauty that's already there. It reveals the greatness that's already in the room. If you live somewhere and you don't take care of your house and it's all beat up and everything's crazy and there's spaghetti on the walls, when you turn on the light, it only amplifies the disgusting nature of what's going on inside that house. But if you take care of your place and you have a nice couch and there's a nice table and there's flowers and there's essential oils going in the background, right? And you turn on the light, it looks great. But you know what didn't do that? The light. So what you're doing here is you're showing Christ to the world. The light that should be shining is one that gets you out of the way and says, this is Christ. Everything's about Christ. Salvation's about Christ. The kingdom's about Christ. Everything is about Jesus Christ. And if he has chosen to save me, that's not because I'm smarter than anyone. That's because Christ. He reached down. He saved me. He did the impossible. He took a sinner's heart and made it love him. The only, so people, when you start talking about predestination and, and God going and chasing and choosing whom he saves, people all of a sudden, wait a minute, you know what I mean? I don't have free will. Look, the only person who doesn't get what they want is the Christian. Okay? If you don't love Jesus, you get exactly what you want. You're running headlong to hell. And Jesus reaches down and he gives you something that you don't want called salvation. And that's why we worship. You didn't save you. Christ did. Christ did. So you are called to do stuff for the kingdom. What do I mean by stuff? Well, here's one end. I'm going to end by asking some questions. Is abortion or child sacrifice the work of God or a work of Satan and sinful men? The work of Satan and evil men. Sinful, evil men. What about sexual immorality? What about pornography? What about cultural Marxism? What about socialism? I mean, we could keep going on and on and on and on, but we all agree, right? All of these things that exist inside the world are not of God, but they are of Satan and evil, sinful men. All right, so then, it's our job, our calling, if you actually want to throw a biblical term on it, as kingdom ambassadors and citizens to be a part of destroying these satanic and humanistic evils and extending God's will and purpose here now. 
So what God has done to heal you from your iniquities, if you love Jesus, you extend that to the rest of the world so that he can apply his balm to all of that. Now, God can do this without you. But he has chosen to involve his people. And so very practically, how can I do that, Pastor? How can I be an agent of change in the world? How can I take that internal love that I have for Jesus, for what he has done for me, and extend that to the rest of the world? How can I put Jesus' enemies under his feet? Because I'm not a pastor. I'm not an evangelist. I'm not writing books. I'm not standing up on a stage preaching. Well, good. And here's what I mean by that. Pastor Darren and I love to preach the gospel. And Lord willing, we're going to keep doing it until they put us in the ground. But our influence is minuscule in comparison to what yours can be. Because here's what we do. We preach to people in the context of church. Now, sometimes we go to the abortion mills and we do that. And, 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 and our ministry is very limited. We, we only preach to people who will listen to us. Right? But when you go out into the world and you do your jobs and you do the things that you are called to do in life that may not be standing up on a stage preaching, you're actually doing the work of the kingdom. For instance, one of the ways that you can put Jesus' enemies under his feet is by giving attention to cultivating a godly marriage and raising godly children. Raising godly children. This is something that the Bible teaches. For instance, in Psalm 124, verse 4, it says this, Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. And I want to give you guys some gospel hope. (laughs) Right? Because here's what I hear all the time being a pastor and and, and just kind of living in the world. Right? Is we turn on the news and, and agreeably, I think I can look around at everybody and I think I'm going to get agreements and head nods here. The world, when we turn on the TV, looks a little scary. Right? And oftentimes you hear parents say something to the effect of, well, that's, I'm, I'm scared to bring children into this world, or I'm scared about, like, what in the world is going to come. Like, are they going to be okay? I mean, I don't even know. Like, should I even have kids because I don't want to bring them into this and all these sorts of things, and, and, and it gets really complicated. And, and here's what the Bible says. Yeah, have lots of them. Why? Because they're arrows in the heart of an enemy. When you raise godly children, they grow up to slay dragons. They go up to do immeasurable harm to the enemies of God. It's one way. Another practical way. To faithfully tithe. Now, we're not a a prosperity preaching church, you know. Darren and I would do this for free, you know. His wife might kill him if he did that. But I'm not married, so I, I would do it for free. So don't hear what I'm not saying. But when you tithe, when you give your money to the kingdom work, and I'm not even necessarily talking about just harmony. Now, harmony should be, if you call this place home, should be your primary giving. But there's so many ministries out there in the world that exist that you can sow extra seeds into. Not to get anything in return, but sowing into the kingdom, the work that they're doing, right? Other church plants, other ministries that try to abolish abortion, People who do evangelism out, of, out, out in front of basketball. All the, I mean, so many things. People who feed the hungry and do all these things, right? The kingdom, work, the kingdom work happens outside the church walls. I forget what the front says when you walk in the door. Darren, what's it say? Training. And even training ground. But I do know what it says walking out because I see it every, ten, every day. You are entering the proving ground. So this is where you come to be sent out to do kingdom work. So when you're in here, pay attention to what's being said so that you can go out there and put Christ's enemies under his feet. And when you tie, that enables ministries that equip other people to do good in the world. Another thing, be the best employer, business owner you can be. Be the best at your job. Make your vocation untouchable by the... Why, why do you do your job so well? 
Everybody else sucks at what they're doing. I'm giving you all the promotions. I'm doing you all the things. Why? Why? Do, why? why do you do so well? Christ. So that he gets the glory. Make the best music and the best art. One of the things that we've forgotten here in America in the last 50 years is actually we used to be really good at this stuff. God created creativity so we should be the best at it. Amen? Trying to preach in less time, so I'll end with saying this. In other words, what I'm trying to say in earnest and very pointedly is that you need to abrasively and unapologetically press the crown rights of this King Jesus onto the world, onto every realm of life, in your marriage, in your friendships, at your job. Everything needs to know that Jesus owns that. And what is the motivation for that? How can you do that? Matthew 28. Matthew 28, and this is the last thing I'll say. It's the Great Commission. You've heard of this, I hope. I'm sure you have. Matthew 28, Jesus tells his people to go do the same exact thing that I'm imploring you to do. To go out there, to do good work for the kingdom, to make disciples, to teach everyone to obey the commandments of Jesus. By the way, you can do that. Jesus is king. And it's not your job to try to convince people of that. It's your job to show people that he is and that they need to bow a knee. They need to bow a knee. So he says this right before he ascends to heaven. It says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of age. So how can you do that? Or why can you do that, rather? What is the motivation behind everything I've just said? Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, because he owns this, you don't have to go out there and be fearful of what might happen, even if they throw you in jail. There's pastors in Canada right now going to jail because they're trying to get people to come to church. Who knows? That might start happening here. And if you don't know me and Pastor Darren very well, we'll be the first ones to go. I'll tell you that right now. All right? Jesus has authority. Nothing happens outside of his sovereignty. And in the moments when it looks like he doesn't know what he's doing, he does. And he comforts us by saying, I am with you always. It's our God. And this book is about his faithfulness. And your life proves his faithfulness. Let's go ahead and bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you for everything that you have done the work that you have done on the cross in your son Jesus Christ. I thank you that he has traded places with us in the great exchange. We ask that you would keep these truths about the kingdom in our hearts and that you would apply them to our lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.